Today, we're going to be covering everything that you need to know about the drug Effexor or venlafaxine. I'm Dr. Joseph Widdering, board-certified psychiatrist, and I'm an expert in psychiatric adverse drug reactions. As always, when we cover the drug, everything is going to be coming from the government website dailymed.com, which has the most up-to-date drug labels, mixed in with some of my clinical experience working with this drug. So the best place to start really is to talk about what this drug is. So what the drug is, it's a uh, it's an SNRI. That's a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which means that it's going to be blocking the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine within the synaptic cleft, and that's going to lead to an increase in these neurotransmitters. Now, with this drug and with most other antidepressants, this has been accompanied by an antidepressant or an anxiety-reducing effect. And you're going to see that here in the indication. So we have indications, meaning it's approved for marketing and use, at least in the U.S., for major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. Now, that may not mean a lot to some people, so I think it's always helpful to talk a little bit about what this drug actually feels like to take for many patients. And so... A lot of the SNRIs and the SSRIs, they have firstly a prominent mood constricting effect. And so if you're having a lot of anxiety and a lot of strong emotions, it turns the dial down on that. So you experience you know, panic, anxiety uh, less intensely when you're on this drug, and that can feel very therapeutic for some people. The other effect of venlafaxine, especially at doses above 150 milligrams a day, is that it has a lot of norepinephrine effects. At the higher dose range, it kind of boosts norepinephrine. And so these are energizing and vigilance enhancing effects. So some people feel more energized when they're on this drug. And that's why a prescriber may choose venlafaxine as opposed to a different drug like Prozac or Lexapro, which is more active with just serotonin. So moving on, let's talk about the dosage and administration of this drug. Most people will start at doses of about 150 milligrams or below for all of these conditions. Most people go up to 300 milligrams a day, but some people will even go as high as 450 milligrams. It comes in various dosage forms. You can get instant release venlafaxine, which you take three times a day. There are capsules for sustained release, which you take twice a day. And then there are extended release capsules where you take them once a day. And the only difference between these is the technology within the capsules that allows for sustained release of the drug. And it can be more convenient for some people. When it comes to tapering, however, you are going to want to swap back to the instant release version of the drug because you can use that version to turn it into liquids or to dry cut it with tablets. And so there's a lot of flexibility in how effects it comes. So we move down, we'll talk about some of the risks of this drug. And it is fairly similar with the other antidepressants. So the main thing that we're worrying about is that it can have paradoxical effects. Now, what does that mean? So Many drugs will have a common effect, and like with most of the SSRIs and the antidepressants, it's going to be anxiety-reducing. But there are always some people who are not going to get that effect. It's just like if you have like five people smoking some cannabis, one person might get paranoid, the other four may be relaxed and laughing and having a good time. There's just things that we don't understand about variability between people. That means some people will respond negatively. And unfortunately, because this drug is used in depression, if you give an already depressed person, if they have an adverse drug reaction, where they become more depressed, more anxious, more agitated, maybe even more paranoid, they can actually be pushed into suicidal behavior. And that's what we've noticed with all of the antidepressants. So whenever someone starts effects or you're going to want to monitor them very closely for negative change in mood, that's not easily understood in the context of maybe new stresses in their life. If it's out of the blue, you're going to immediately suspect the drug for making them worse and discontinue it. That drug, that effect as well is more common in people who are under age 25. There's something about being younger that makes you more likely to have paradoxical reaction to effects on. Serotonin syndrome. Now, this is common with most of the antidepressants. This is quite rare, but if you take this drug with uh, other drugs that act on serotonin or norepinephrine or even dopamine, you can push someone into an unstable state where they can experience things like uh, muscle rigidity, tremors, fevers, autonomic instability, which is experienced as racing heart rate, high blood pressure. They can have confusion. This is a medical emergency. And so if someone becomes very confused, feverish, uh, right after they started taking this drug, you're going to suspect serotonin syndrome and they need to go to the emergency room. Unlike you know, Prozac and Lexapro, which mainly act on the serotonin system, because this drug is acting on norepinephrine, it actually has blood pressure effects. And so you can actually have elevated uh, blood pressure with uh, venlafaxine. And that may be important for someone who already has pre-existing hypertension. So you're going to want to monitor 
your blood pressure carefully with this drug, especially at the higher doses. Like the SSRIs, these drugs do impact platelet clotting. And so you're going to be at an increased risk of bleeds when you take Effexor, just like with the other antidepressants. Next, we have a condition called acute closure glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is a condition in the eyes that is caused by increased intraocular pressure. And so what happens with these drugs, especially the stimulating ones, is they can cause medriasis, which is these like big kind of dinner plate sized pupils. And that just happens when someone is in a high sympathetic state. You know, if you're giving someone norepinephrine or adrenaline, their pupils dilate just like if someone was on cocaine. This effect, however, inhibits some of the um, circulation of the fluid throughout the eye and it can lead to an increased pressure within that. So if all of a sudden someone starts complaining about visual impairment or pain within their eye, you're going to suspect acute closure glaucoma. You're going to have them go to the emergency room. I've actually never seen this happen before, so I think this is relatively rare but serious side effect of this medication. Activation of mania or hypomania, as mentioned previously, for reasons we don't understand, these drugs may tip someone into an overstimulated state where they become manic appearing, they can become disinhibited. Sometimes they can even have psychosis. And so if someone has no history of that in the past, or maybe they have a history of bipolar and it's happening more frequently, you're going to suspect the drug as worsening them. Discontinuation syndrome. So this is essentially drug withdrawal. This drug, just like all of the other antidepressants, can cause a nasty withdrawal. Effexor is actually well known for having one of the nastiest withdrawals because it has such a short half-life. And so whereas some other drugs may take several weeks to get out of your system, like Prozac and such, Effexor can be gone within a few days. I believe the half-life of the active drug is something like eight hours, and the metabolite might only be up to 12 hours. So what that means is you can go from being on this drug to completely being off this drug and its active metabolites in about three days. That's a big hit to someone. So because if you've spent years getting used to this drug and then with, in that amount of time, it's completely gone out of your brain, you're going to have really severe withdrawal. This one is notorious for having very severe withdrawal symptoms. So brain zaps, dizziness, high anxiety. And so you're going to want to taper this one carefully. Another thing that's similar with the other antidepressants is the risk of a condition called protracted withdrawal. This doesn't happen in everyone, but in some people who are very sensitive to withdrawal, if they go into a severe withdrawal, they're going to develop enduring neurological problems afterwards. Uh, we've got a lot of videos on my channel about protracted withdrawal injury, but that is an uncommon side effect of having severe withdrawal. So you're going to want to taper this medication carefully. Seizures, this drug and all of the other antidepressants, they actually lower the seizure threshold, meaning it makes it easier for people to have seizures especially if they're on other stimulating medications or they have a history of epilepsy. So if you have a seizure for the first time and you've recently started venlafaxine, maybe you don't want to go on anti-epileptics. You might want to try and come off this medication first to see if it goes away. Hyponatremia, this means low salt. This is common with a lot of the antidepressants. It happens mostly in older women. And the way that this is going to present is with a lot of lethargy and confusion. And so you have someone develop lethargy and confusion. They go into the emergency room. They have low salt. This drug can be responsible for that. It has to be stopped. It can be a pretty serious condition. Weight and height changes in pediatric patients. So in general, this has a lot in common with the stimulants like the ADHD medications. People tend to put on less weight with this medication and it's especially more pronounced in children. And also children who take this drug, especially children under age 12, will actually grow less than children, will grow less than people above age 12. So there's an effect of this drug that seems to suppress growth and weight. Uh, we've got appetite changes. As I had mentioned, some people will experience a lot of appetite suppression. Again, not unusual considering that it has quite stimulating effects, especially at the higher doses. Interstitial lung disease, disease and eosinic uh, pneumonia. This is an inflammatory problem. I Personally, I've never seen this before, but some people who take this drug, they get inflammation within their lungs. It's believed to be immune system coming from the immune system. So this drug is doing something there. Again, an uncommon adverse reaction. Uh, sexual dysfunction, very common adverse reaction with all of the antidepressants. And um, venlafaxine causes this as well. It happens to around 50% of people who take this drug and other SSRIs and SNRIs. And there is a small subset of people who will go on to develop persistent sexual dysfunction after they stop the drug. So that's very serious. And that means you only really want to be taking this drug if you're having quite serious anxiety and depression, because that is a serious problem if you um, develop persistent sexual dysfunction. So let's have a look at some of the more common adverse reactions from the clinical trials. So we've got this one here for the adverse reactions that led to discontinuation during the studies. And so 
asthenia, now that's fatigue and weakness. These are percentages. So we had, you know, about 2% of people dropping out for that. It's much larger, uh, about three times higher than in the placebo. Nausea, look at this, is about 10 times higher in the drug group than the placebo. That's not uncommon. A lot of people on these antidepressants will have GI problems like nausea. Dizziness as well is happening um, at nearly three times the rate. Insomnia is happening as well at a little over three times the rate. That's not that unexpected. These are common things that happen with most antidepressants. So let's move on now. We're going to go over a few important drug interactions. So the first one is MAOIs. These are older antidepressants like Nardil or Parnate or Selegiline, which is called MSAM. Uh, most people aren't going to be taking these. And if you take venlafaxine with these drugs, you can cause a hypertensive crisis. And so you cannot take them at the same time. And you have to do a washout, for instance. So if you were to take one of these MAOIs, you would need to make sure that you're off venlafaxine for at least three days to get that drug completely washed out of your system, maybe longer if you're having liver or kidney problems before you would take an MAOI. The second issue is other serotonergic drugs. So these could be SSRIs, and we're going to want to be mindful of these drugs because we don't want to cause serotonin syndrome. And so there are a lot of things that we don't know of as kind of being serotonergic. And so we're also going to be looking out for things like lithium, Things like opiates can be serotonergic, St. John's wort as well. This, again, is rare. I often see people on multiple serotonergic drugs without serotonin syndrome. If you are on uh, another serotonergic drug, it's just you're at increased risk. It's not like a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen. Drugs that interfere with hemostasis because this drug has platelet blocking effects, you're going to want to be especially cautious about uh, bleeding problems, especially if you're on other anticoagulants as well. Now, venlafaxine and its metabolites are going to be going through the CYP3A enzymes in the liver and also the CYP2D6 enzymes in the liver. So if you are taking drugs that are blocking those enzymes or inhibiting them, you're going to increase the amount of this drug and its active metabolite, uh, desvenlafaxine in your blood. And so you're going to be want to be mindful about that. So if you are on other drugs, you may want to do a search online to find out whether they are a CYP3A inhibitor or a CYP2D6 inhibitor. Let's talk about use in specific populations. And this is very similar to the other antidepressants. This drug does cross the placenta. So if you're pregnant, there will be fetal exposure. There is some data out there showing a slightly increased risk in uh, autism. This drug also crosses into the milk as well. So if you are breastfeeding, it will be going into your baby through the breast milk as well. So just another thing to keep in mind. Drug abuse and dependence, this drug is not thought of as being addictive, but definitely it is dependence forming. And that's why people have such a nasty withdrawal reaction when they come off. Now going to the metabolism of this drug. Venlafaxine is an interesting drug. So the chemical venlafaxine and its metabolite. So after it goes through the liver, it's broken down. And one of the metabolites is desvenlafaxine, also known as Pristique. This is also a separate drug that has been marketed, and it is the metabolite. Venlafaxine, in order to become Pristique, which is metabolically active and also having an antidepressant effect, goes through the liver. So the liver plays a role in converting venlafaxine into desvenlafaxine, which is also active. And then it gets conjugated. And what this means is the liver is going to put it into a form where it can be removed from circulation, and then it's going to be excreted through the urine. And so with venlafaxine, we've got important liver effects and kidney effects. And so this means you're going to have to work with your doctor to reduce your dose if you're having prominent hepatic problems, so liver problems or kidney problems. So both of those conditions are going to require you to lower the dose of venlafaxine. And you're going to have to do that with a doctor because otherwise you end up on too much of the drug. Okay, so let's move on now and let's talk about some of the clinical trial results for the effectiveness. So venlafaxine has a lot of indications. And so first we're going to start with major depressive disorder. The studies here, they showed that they did two placebo-controlled trials in moderately depressed patients. And then they did a placebo-controlled trial on inpatients, people in a psychiatric hospital that had a more melancholic form of depression. This is more lethargy and fatigue. It's a more severe form of depression. They use the HAMD21, which is a rating scale for depression, very commonly used. And that has um, that goes all the way up to 64. So a score of 64 is uh, max. And so let's go and have a look at some of the study results. So studies one and two, these were the ones in the moderately depressed outpatients. This was their mean score when they came in. So this is how, I guess, depressed the groups were. So the effects of group was 24, the placebo group was 23. That's really what you want to see. You want to see, you know, the same amount of depression between the two comparison groups. 
Over here is where it gets interesting. So this is the average change from baseline after the intervention. So these were 12 week studies. And so uh, in the group that was given Effexa 75 milligrams to 225, they were able to be flexibly dosed. They had a, an improvement of 11 points and the placebo group had an improvement of seven points. So we have a difference between placebo and the active drug of four. Again, so not that much, you know, on a scale that goes up to 64 points, an improvement of about four points at the end of the 12 week period. That improvement was slightly more. In the second study, that was essentially nearly uh, identical to it, you know, the same design. But down here is where it gets kind of interesting because study three, as I mentioned, this was for the inpatients, the people with the melancholic depression, you know, the more sedated, fatigued form. And we actually had a little bit of a bump here. So we had a, a difference of about 10 points. Now, 10 points, to me, that's a lot on a scale of 64. And so this may say something about venlafaxine in these more kind of fatigued, depressed patients. And that makes sense. So here was the other difference in these melancholic depressive patients. They went all the way up to doses of 375. That's a high dose of venlafaxine. And what we know about this drug is as you go above doses of 150 milligrams a day, there's a lot more effect on norepinephrine. And so this drug hits serotonin and norepinephrine, but much more effect on norepinephrine at doses above 150. So this may say that in these more fatigued, more lethargic, depressed patients, you know, going up to these higher doses of Effexor was helpful. Okay, so let's move on. The second indication, this is for generalized anxiety disorder. And so we've got two eight-week placebo-controlled trials that we're going to be looking at, and then a six-month study. And these were done with the, the HAM-A, so Hamilton Rating Scale for anxiety. Now this rating scale goes all the way up to 56 points. You know, the higher the score, the more anxious you are. And so if we go down here, let's, let's see what they found. So this doesn't look as good as the data from depression, because as you can see here, the placebo group at the end of this study had lost nine points. And if you just look up here, you know, 11, 11, 12, that's not that much of a difference. This is, you know, 1.5 to 2.6 difference from placebo on a scale out of 56. That doesn't look that great. Uh, same here, you know, very marginal. The scores are a little bit higher in these studies. But again, to me, those aren't really big changes. And so I might think that venlafaxine is a drug that I'm probably not going to reach for as my first choice for patients with generalized anxiety disorder. The separation from placebo just isn't large enough for me. So let's move on now. Let's have a look at the next indication. And this is for social anxiety disorder. So that's different from generalized anxiety disorder. We're now looking at social anxiety disorder. And this was measured with the Leibowitz social anxiety scale. Now this scale goes all the way up to 144. So 144, if you had that, that's very severe. That's the worst score you could get. So what we have here, we have four double blind placebo controlled trials lasting 12 weeks. And we had one study, study five that went on for six months. So let's have a look at what we found. Here we've got at the end of the study, they lost you know, roughly 20 points on the scale. So remember the scales out of 144, the group on the medication had lost 31 points on average. So that's a difference of about 11 on a scale of 144. I'll leave you to kind of make a judgment on how substantial you think that is. And we saw this kind of replicated in the other one. So again, a 10 point difference coming down to study three. It was getting a little bit better here. We've got now a 17 point difference. Study four, we had a 14 point difference. And this was the study that went out over six months just to see kind of how they were doing in a longer term study. And it's 14 points as well. And so I guess that's kind of, you know, 14 points out of 144 improvement, modest. Is, is what I would say for that. Now let's go on to panic disorder. Now, this is a condition characterized by a lot of panic attacks. They measured it in a number of ways, the effectiveness of the drug, but really they were just looking at panic attacks. And these studies were 12-week uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And let's have a look down here. We can see the percentage of patients free from full symptoms of panic attacks uh, okay, so 34% in placebo during the study, you know, 61% on this higher dose and 54% on this dose here. Roughly, I'm seeing kind of a, you know, 20 to 25% difference there in study one. Here in study two, it's about the same, 20 to 25%. So it seems like it is doing something. I mean, that seems like a sizable reduction in panic attacks. So 
Dimetra showing this seems to be maybe a bit more effective in panic attacks than in the other indications. My perspective on this, I mean, at least from the clinical trial data, looks more effective for severe forms of depression where there's a lot of lethargy and fatigue, this kind of melancholic depression, and then also for panic disorder as well. The efficacy results were a bit more convincing. There you have it. That is our review of the venlafaxine label. Please let me know what your experience has been with this drug in the comments below. I would love to hear about it.